welcome to the Conception Channel Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a Conception Channel a Podcast brought to you by the Being Fertile Program and Yin Still Reproductive Wellness. I have the pleasure of being here today with Katie, and she, uh, we go quite far back together. Um, we worked together uh, when she was trying to uh, do everything she could to accomplish her dream of family, and she's been kind enough to to share her story. She's quite an advocate for for anyone, you know, needing any support in any way that that has the same same goal and and is is. Uh, at a point in their life where they're struggling. So welcome, Katie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Spence. Oh, Pleasure to be here. You look, you. I know you just got back from Hawaii. And yes. I know it was uh, a lot with, with little ones, as you just mm-hmm. mentioned, but you look you look so great and you look like Thanks. you've got Thanks. a nice glow. and as, as refreshing as a holiday can be with little kids. So it's super. <laughs> Thanks. You got out of your regular routine. You know? Exactly. And, yeah, you can't... Uh, yeah, that is a part that changes once once you you Absolutely. reach your goal but i know i, I and, and i said that to katie as, as as soon as we jumped on the skype call and her instant reaction still was oh but it's you know i just such gratitude for for yeah. for having her little gifts yeah i think um gratitude is what carries people through this journey it's yeah. it's, no. it's what you got to keep in your back pocket the whole time oh, and so. uh yeah i certainly didn't have that at the beginning though no. uh, i I was kind of in a fog uh, mm-hmm. for several years. Mm-hmm. So um, even before we met, um, I'd been trying to get pregnant since I was about um, 32 years old. Right. My husband and I realized we wanted to start a family. And um, I was not getting my period regularly after I went off the pill. And so this was kind of a warning sign. And I really, you know, I dragged my heels and I took my time to get to my doctor to discuss it. I thought, Oh, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. Everything will be fine. Mm-hmm. And um, months go by, years go by, and um, you know, to get a referral from your GP then to um, a fertility clinic was a big leap emotionally for me. Mm-hmm. I did not want to be in that fertility or infertility category, and so I didn't let myself um, accept the referral. I wanted to see a, a regular gynecologist and and just hope if they could help me along. Right with some other measures. In the meantime, I saw two naturopaths. Mm -hmm. I saw an energy healer. Um, I, I started doing strange yoga, you know, I did everything I could. um, And, you know, my husband was a big uh, partner of mine in that. And uh, things are not coming along. So um, I finally saw um, uh, someone at a fertility clinic. um, And the great doctors there really you know, we're, we're encouraging but very realistic about my chances. Um, right. I was diagnosed with PCOS. Right. Um, I also had uh, hypothalamic a- amenorrhea. Mm-hmm. So um, I had some overlapping, overlapping symptoms. And, um, you know, I was a regular person going to work, um, like, like everyone else, you know, had, had different problems and different, you know, uh, happy times as well. But this was definitely a, a shadow um, that I was having a hard time acknowledging. And uh, I think I, I mentioned to you that even, uh, you know, at the library, there, there's a stack of books um, on infertility. Mm-hmm. And um, I was reluctant to sort of dive into that that category. I didn't even, I didn't want to be part of that um, ISBN number at the library. I wanted to be over in the um, new parent section of, of the library. And it was, it was really hard uh, for me to start reading up about what what I needed to do. Right. Did you so, can, to clarify can I back up just a yeah. second? Um PCOS uh atypical they might they might refer to it as um uh Katie's a, a slender slender lady and and mm-hmm. uh, uh hypothalamic amenorrhea just to clarify is is uh, uh leads to uh no periods or uh periods that have you know, an extended length between them. Yeah. Yeah. So just to clarify for people, so that, that kind of, you started realizing that right after you got off the birth control, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I knew that, you know, from going off it periodically in my twenties that, um, uh, my period wasn't, 
wasn't normal, but it was, I, I figured, and, and my doctor said, you know, it takes a little while after you get off the pill for it to regu- you know, become regular. Mm-hmm. So I got very good at recording it. 50 days, 60 days, 100 days, 200 days went by. Then when a year went by, I realized I'm in big trouble here. If I'm not getting a period, I'm not ovulating. And um, coupled with this, um, I think the anxiety of not being able to get pregnant led to um, stomach problems. I mean, I, I would have stomach aches that would last for days. And, um, you know, I, I just couldn't... Um, I couldn't enjoy my life because these these stomach aches would, would come and go. And I sort of thought they were linked, but, you know, I, I saw um, a gastroenterologist. I, I saw, um, you know, an endocrinologist uh, because I had sort of mild hypothyroidism. Um, and, you know, the I, I just didn't get very far. And um, it, it became, uh, became a big problem. To conceal this, I, I was concealing this problem from a lot of people that I cared about because I didn't want to disappoint them with the possibility of not having a child. I didn't want them to take on the burden of, of my sadness. Um, it was enough that I had to deal with my sadness. I didn't want to sort of compound that with carrying someone else's worry about me. Yeah. But what I really learned was that um, worry gets you absolutely nowhere. Mm. And um, the stasis was killing me both in my job and um, in terms of dealing with this problem. And so as a prophet of a previous generation once said, if you've got a problem uh, or if something's wrong, you got to whip it. you got to whip it good. <laughs> and um, once I started addressing it by um, actually going to the fertility clinic and uh, speaking with doctors, I felt like I was moving along. Right. And um, so I ended up um, having a laparoscopy to look at my, uh, my tubes right. and to remove some endometriosis that was possibly uh, causing me some pain right. abdominally. Um, that was good. It was so gratifying to get the results of that surgery and have uh, the doctor tell me that uh, your uterus looks healthy. It looks like you could carry a pregnancy. Awesome. Um, you know, I, I had nothing but bad news. You know, my periods are stretching out to 200 days. That I thought, wow, you know, someone's saying that I can, I can really do this. That's a, that's a miracle. And um, the the assessment from um, my doctor uh, was that I, um, I I was capable of, of carrying a child, and that um, I was making enough eggs. I was, I I, I could make en- eggs, but um, that they. They weren't going to be fertilized easily. I had a 3% chance of getting pregnant in his estimation without any intervention. And so we settled on um, uh, IUI uh, so that um, I would uh, start, you know, taking the injections and stimulating uh, follicles to um, to make eggs. Like a super and ovulation, yeah. Super ovulation. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, and and then um, we I would be inseminated uh, with my uh, husband's sperm, and that that would hopefully result in the pregnancy. And I, I mean the the emotional toll that learning to inject yourself uh, takes is also something that I was a little bit unprepared for. I thought um, if I learned the process of um, you know how to inject myself and keeping track of um, you know, when I have to be at the doctor's office, that maybe I could uh, win at pregnancy. You know, maybe if I just organize my way into this, that um, if, if I have enough sticky tabs on my portfolio of, of documents, the volumes of documents that um, that I can win. And it's it doesn't work like that. There's a lot of luck involved. Um, and it is it's an art. It's a magic as well as a science. Um, there There's no sort of perfect formula for how how this works. And I think that's a good thing. Um, and in my experience, uh, the doctors are highly responsible and, um, you know, kind without building you up too much about, um, you know, your chances. Yeah. Hope is great. And it, and it was a wonderful thing, but, um, I don't felt, feel like I was falsely promised anything. Um, I was pretty realistic. Anyway, I, I got through, um, the first, um, you know, few days of these um, injections, and they're monitoring you as you go. And and then my doctor um, found that um, I had not responded well to the medication. That I was making far too many eggs. Um, I thought this was a wonderful problem. I thought 
yay me, finally a fecundity after feeling, you know, barren for my, you know, my adult life. Mm -hmm. But that's a problem in terms of multiples um, in pregnancy. And so I had the option of canceling this, um, you know, um, this process, this round of um, IUI altogether and, you know, kissing our money goodbye and our sort of emotional investment or switching to in vitro um, halfway through something that is far more costly and something that my husband and I were not prepared for. We, you know, there it's, it's more invasive. Um, and, and I, we had to wrap our minds around that in one day. We had one day to decide. And I remember I met my husband at the library, dragged him out of work and we had to come up with what we were going to do. And, um, it was a very hard decision, very hard decision. And we decided to go for it. And, um, and that is when, um, that is just when I met you, Spence, actually, I, I looked to get some acupuncture and some support, um, before, um, egg retrieval. Right. And, uh, I think I had one session with you and, uh, it was all prepped to go for, um, you know, I had the eggs retrieved, um, waited a few days. Um, I, I had a few eggs ready to go and I was, I was all set to go and, and have those implanted. Embryos, and, actually. Embryos, embryos, yeah. Mm -hmm. So embryos formed. Uh, we were really excited, and um, then the morning that I was set to have those embryos or embryo implanted, I got a call from the clinic saying, um, "I'm sorry to inform you that none of those eggs, none of those embryos have survived, right. Right. and um, you won't be you won't be coming in today." Right. And uh, I, I was heartbroken. Yeah. I, I thought, you know a um, fertility clinic, why are you a business if you do this to women? It's, it seemed like some cruel punishment to put me through the ringer and then end up with nothing. And, and I've learned since that that happens every two or three months at the clinic, you know, that it, it doesn't work out. And um, I had a horrible day and um, just wanted to crawl into a little hole. Um, what, what, I learned, what I've learned since is that when you're in those dark periods, um, at least I... At least I tried. At least I did something. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it's as horrible as it was. It was better than doing nothing. Yeah. Um, I I got to lay the land at the fertility clinic through it. I got a crash course in it. And even though everything came crashing down, it allowed me to start to cultivate some gratitude in my life. For instance, I had never I'd never been pregnant before in my life, so that means I'd never lost a pregnancy. Right. And um, I, I was grateful. You know, I've had friends that have gone through that. Um, I, I was grateful that I, I, I didn't have to experience that. Uh, I was grateful that I lived in a country where these options were available to me, um, that we were of a certain means that where we could, um, we could pay for this kind of treatment. Um, I started to realize that, you know, if, had I been born elsewhere, I might have been cast out of the village. And that, right. that would have been it. So, a different era, for sure. A, yeah. a different era, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, once I became a little bit more aware of those things, I think I was better prepared to be on a mission to, um, you know, try it again. And my, it was my doctors that really encouraged me to, to try it again. And, and I'm grateful um, to them for that. I, I was prepared to look into adoption or, or something else at that point. And, and they said, you know, um, you've got a chance um, that if we tweak the, the medication, the injections that um, – you could have a successful pregnancy, and I, and I think it might be worth it to give you one more try. So, so is, I did. Is this is, so? Is that sorry to interrupt? I, yeah. Is that approximately, you know, at that time when that when you had put your faith into uh, the the medical model uh, of yeah. in vitro, and it and it didn't even result in a in a transfer. Is that yeah. when? the soul searching and the spiritual part of the journey kind of began. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it, it began with, um, meeting you and coming to you still. It also, um, I also quit my job. Mm -hmm. We went up, we went on a long vacation and, um, all of these things had to fall into place. I realized that there was no sort of, um, there was no sort of fast food version of, uh, acupuncture therapy before embryo transfer. I, I came to see you maybe two days before I was having this embryo transfer. We hadn't worked together and sort of been able to build myself up. Um, I, I was flailing, and 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 I I needed months of uh, acupuncture and 
um, some nutritional assistance, even though I, you know, I, I'd been to culinary school, I knew what I was doing in terms of my food intake, but you know, I went on a cleanse. We eliminated a lot of stuff from our diets. We tried to just both of us feel as, as good as we possibly could going into it. And so um, by the time I tried around again later that year, I think we waited, you know, four or five months uh, before doing it again, um, I was the happiest um, infertility patient going into that clinic. I bounced in there because um, I made the decision to do it again. I thought, what have I got to lose? You know, I'm I'm unlikely to get pregnant without it. So might as well go in there uh, expecting the best. And I remember the nurses remarked on it. They're like, why are you so happy? It's not my disposition typically. Um, but I was like, you know, I'm here. Might as well give it a try. Uh, why make this harder than it has to be? Um, again, started to just feel a little bit more grateful for things. And, you know, it was funny because I, I was in the um, – uh, the waiting room at the fertility clinic, which, I mean, someone should do a study in waiting rooms and yeah, would yeah. tell you about a place and environment. And the people, you know, it's it's filled with women just like me, all pretending not really to notice each other, um, and and families and um, you know and and men, you know, gay couples um, trying to conceive, and um, they have a little wine cooler filled with bottled water and. Um, I think my husband remarked that, um, oh, look, they have free water. And I said, no, no, they don't. That water is $10,000. I mean, it's it is, magic water. <laughs> it is not, it is nothing's free. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, through, through all of it, my, my sense of humor got, got me through it. You know, we, we were delighted to go in there every day for, for a few weeks. And, uh, but I, I, continued to obsess over um, uh, statistics, you know, at, at, the top, at the time, you know, I started, you know, looking into becoming pregnant about 32. I was 37 by the time I made my way uh, to meet you and, and to the fertility clinic. And, um, you know, they, they give you the stats on, on how many embryos, uh, you know, you can possibly make and how many survive the... Um, you know, the, I, I don't even remember the, process, the yeah. maturation yeah. process. And it's, you know, you have to become comfortable with the fact that you are going to lose eggs. You're going to lose embryos. You're going to lose uh, potentiality. And uh, you're not going to suddenly gain a few in, in the process once they've been retrieved. And, um, you know, you, again, you sort of want to be, you want to be successful. You want to have as many options to you as possible. But, it's, that's not the way it goes. You're you're gonna you're gonna lose as as you go, and uh, it was very important for me to stay focused on the fact that I wanted a healthy pregnancy, and I I would give anything for it. Um, so I, I tried to stay focused on that goal and stay as cool as a cucumber as I could. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately for me, remaining cool meant um, not discussing it um, with anybody except for uh, my practitioners. Uh, my husband and my brother, mm -hmm. and um, keeping that close knit um, really, mm -hmm. it it really uh, worked in my favor. I I regret telling a wider circle of people that I was doing infertility treatment um, the first time I did it because it meant I had to make some really difficult phone calls right. to people afterwards. I, I think a lot of women uh, would react differently to that. They they need mm -hmm. people to know what's what's going on with them, but for me. It, that's not how it worked. I was, I was really happy to have keep this private, because really, you know, when you can see the child privately, um, that's it's a very private thing between people. Typically, and, yeah. mm -hmm. typically, and I felt like I already had twenty people involved, and, I, and as a result, I had twenty people rooting for me, which was which was nice. I really, um, you know, I, I felt I had the right kind of support. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Oh, yeah. that's so good. So okay, so. So from there, you decided to, how, how did the, the digestive and, and how did you prepare yourself? Because you, you weren't even sure if you were going to ever do this again. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I like, like a dietary things you mean that I did or, um... I don't know. I just, what, you know, I mean, between, 
It was, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was even mm -hmm. a, a challenge to get to the place where you wanted to step into that arena again yeah. or subject yeah. yourself to in vitro or, or stimulation or just, I don't know. So yeah, the, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, some of the nuts and bolts you did because you had that, some stomach problems, you know, yeah. and, you know, you. I found that, you know, cutting out uh, a lot of things bef before um, we did the next um, round of treatment helped. You know, I, I hadn't been drinking a lot for years and because I, I got tired of, um, uh, the main reason I, I stopped drinking in truth is it didn't feel good. And also uh, I, I got tired of uh, reacting to, to people when they noticed that I wasn't drinking at a party because you could get the odd sort of nod or wink from someone saying, oh, you know, is she pregnant? And so I thought it would be much easier to just stop drinking so I'd eliminate that, um, you know, sensitive point. And um, so that was very interesting just to sort of take that off the table entirely. But um, so just premeditated, hey, it's crazy. Like, oh, yeah. Just everything, you're, you're protecting yourself. Yeah, I, I protected myself in so many ways. I mean, I remember early on, um, you know, someone mentioning to me when, when I said that I wasn't getting my period, someone said, you know, well, you know, maybe that's a sign. Maybe that your body is trying to tell you that having kids is not for you. And, um, I carry, I carry that around with me still. Um, yeah, biologically, my body wasn't ovulating. What, what does that mean? Does that mean that I'm not supposed to be a mom? Uh, I suddenly began to question my um, my reproductive self, my my feminine self, what it means to be a woman. Uh, I'd never been sort of goo goo about having kids or gaga. I'd, I'd never uh, bought parenting magazines. I never collected baby clothing. But that doesn't mean that I don't have every right to to be a mom. And if my biology is sort of telling me one thing, why is the core of my being? Um, pulling me towards parenthood like a force that I, I couldn't explain. Mm. So, I, I mean, my advice to, to women going through that or having people say, you know, um, you know, maybe your body's trying to tell you something, sure, take, take the signals that your body is giving you, take it on board, but um, also filter out the noise. If there is something that's not serving you or some advice you've gotten that's not serving you, because deep down you know, then leave it alone and um, start talking to people that will give you the resources you need and the tools to move forward. It's, I, I wish I'd realized that sooner. Well, I mean, so. these uh, comments like that, I mean, I, so much in life, even little things, I mean, people are far more sensitive than people understand yes. it often. And, yes. And saying just something simple, like someone getting mad at you in traffic, certain people, that can affect them the whole day. Of course. If you cut someone out, whatever, you know. Yeah. So something like that. I mean, I, I've been in working with women like yourself for 15 years, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I, I blame, you know, our environment, our world, our mm -hmm. social conditioning, everything for, mm -hmm. for biology that isn't, isn't in harmony with with its true nature and that's all yeah. it is i mean it's yeah. not that oh well you know god gave you a uterus well, yeah yes yeah. you're not supposed to yeah you know it's it, it's just okay we live in a toxic soup whatever it, 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 yeah. it might be and we've got to find your way back that's all and yeah. yours is unique to from everyone yeah. else's yeah yeah it's it's fascinating and i i hope that in my lifetime we'll find out more about why my period stopped or why I, I have the conditions I do. You know, I had a, ch a healthy childhood, um, healthy teen years, but I, I wonder, you know, I question, did I microwave too much plastic in the 1980s, you know, before we, we knew stuff like that? Like, what happened yes. to me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we luckily have learned something in the, you know, the years since, and I, I, I lead my life differently now. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, who knows? Yeah, who, who knows? knows? Well, it's funny, I, cause I, you know, when I, I try and, uh, you know, talk to women about treating themselves as though they were pregnant Yes. and, and cleaning out their home, uh, you know, and their personal care products and all these things, the yeah. food, as though they were feeding 
it would yeah. only, if it's only suited to their baby would they have it in their home or use it on themselves and it's yeah and i think that is such a great place to start from even in such a toxic generation that our parents lived in everything yeah. was prepared and packaged and you know monsanto was yeah. like the king and um yeah. Our parents still tried to find like Johnson and Johnson unscented no baby tears shampoo, you know. Yeah. And so uh, kudos to that, you know. Yeah. So I mean, I, you know, in cancer, we're all, you can do what you can, you know, and, and that's that, those 10 steps that we went through. It's like, well, do what you can, create a plan, then have faith that that's going to change trajectory. <laughs> yes. You know? And, and from there, it, it is okay, now I have faith and I can surrender to the fact that I'm taking care of me. Yeah. And now it's, it's more of a spiritual journey and, and, and working with, you know, the, 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 the resources that are out there yeah. right now to, to the village, you know, it's, to accomplish my goal. It's so key because um, I, I felt helpless. I felt like I, I can't do anything to affect um, the way that my body is behaving or not behaving. And, um, to have a plan like that is means you're doing something. You're getting out of that stasis, uh, which is healthy in itself, I think, for the mind to sort of focus on something else. And um, not obsessively, but to, um, you know, modify what's what's coming at you. And, I mean, there unfortunately, there are industries that are geared to, um, you know, women about to conceive or um, women who become pregnant. And these products look all shiny and new and wonderful, and so many of them aren't. And it's sort of hard to believe that something that's marketed so intentionally um, towards women in my position is not healthy and you sort of have to your my radar started early because of meeting you and um, because I started to learn about it um, so so that was great yeah, yeah. So, so then now you felt I, I kind of remember the time where it was like I'm ready now I'm I need, ready. Now I need I'm, to reconvince my husband and yeah, step forward, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, it's it was a financial decision. It was an emotional decision. Um, you know, he didn't want to see me disappointed like I was because I think the feeling was that, um, you know, this would be it. Right. And talk about putting all your eggs in one basket. You know, I always knew that, well... IVF is out there. If we had to go that route, we, we could, but it, he took a lot of convincing and, you know, I had to convince myself because there's no sort of magic solution to infertility. It's, it's not one thing. And as, as we got deeper into um, learning about how fertility works, I realized that we, we could not count on IVF. There are so many things that have to fall into place for it to work. So it, it was it was very difficult. Uh, it put stress on our on our marriage to um, to come to a place where we could agree to do it again. And once he was on board, I felt like he was more on board than he was before, um, and that's because things were um, on our terms. We we were doing it privately. He was you know doing a lot of soul searching. He was ready to be a dad. He you know, and um, he could see how desperately I wanted it. I was willing to do this again. And so, again, I became a really good patient. I got good at injecting myself, I remember. I didn't let it dictate my day. I wasn't sort of freaked out about the injections. I would bring my little kit with me, go to the YMCA at the time when you're supposed to uh, inject yourself, do that privately in a little cubicle, get myself all sorted, and then go and work out. I didn't, I didn't make it a big deal because I figured a lot of people have to go through a lot more. And um, so I, I felt good going in. And um, when I had the eggs retrieved, it you know, looked like we had a decent number. I thankfully don't remember how many we had. But um, we, uh, you know, a few days go by, I think it was day five, and I was waiting for that phone call to say, you can't come in, there's nothing left. But um, we had uh, two embryos that looked good and um that was unbelievable and based on my history having never been pregnant having been sort of trying to become pregnant for over five years um my my doctor recommended that we have two embryos implanted now this is such a complicated decision and again i'm so grateful that we live in canada where there are regulations about these kinds of things you know um <laughs> Even if I had six embryos, there's no way those were going to be implanted all at once. It's it's too dangerous. Um, 
but right up into the parking lot of the fertility clinic for um, the embryos to be implanted, my husband and I were debating the merits of one or two, one or two. There's a possibility to save one for family planning later on, but there are risks associated with, you know, defrosting, so to speak. And um, I, I like that, that we had the option for two. And um, when we got in there and I got all, got in my scrubs, you know, Doc said, we're doing two, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, we're doing two. Um, because I thought, what are the chances? What are the chances that me, having never been pregnant, would be pregnant with two? That would be hilarious and unbelievable. And let's cover all our bases here. Yeah, let's do two. And, um, you know, and then there's a period of a few weeks where, you know, you're not supposed to take a home pregnancy test. You got to wait for the blood test to, so that um, you can find with absolute certainty if you're pregnant or not pregnant. Well, two days after those two embryos were implanted, which, by the way, for people about to go through it, this is not a painful process. The transfer. Physically, yeah. The transfer. Mm -hmm. um, neither is the retrieval. I was very comfortable throughout all of it. Um, in fact, you know, through conscious sedation, um, you know, I started to talk about things uh, in the conscious sedation <laughs> I shouldn't have been talking about. I was very, very comfortable through the whole process. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but days after uh, those embryos were implanted, I became so overwhelmed with a different feeling. I thought, if this is not pregnancy, what is going on? Mm -hmm. I was convinced that physically something was going on with me. And I thought, if it's not twins, then what is it? Because there's no way that someone who is pregnant with just one child could feel this possibility of pregnancy i was absolutely certain and sure enough once the blood test came back yeah my numbers were sort of sky high indicating the possibility of two we didn't know at that point but uh, we got a lovely phone call from the doctors saying yeah looks like you're pregnant and i was lucky enough to receive that phone call mm -hmm. uh, on a beach with my husband just out for a relaxing stroll. We knew we'd get that phone call on a certain day. And um, it was a lot more glamorous than being in a bathroom alone together. Uh, yeah. So I, I really, I treasure that moment and I will for the rest of my life. It was, it was a great feeling. I love how yeah. you framed that. That's so awesome. Yeah. And so now. <laughs> and now, now so much has happened. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I've lived 10 lives in the space where, you know, I last saw you. Mm -hmm. um, I had a great pregnancy. I went for my first sonogram, and um, uh, there on the screen were were two black plums. <laughs> and I thought, is that what I think it is? And the doc said, you know, because they never know how someone's going to react. I said, you know, you know what that is, don't you, Katie? And I said, yeah, that's two. It's, it's two babies. And um, I was, I was only six weeks along. I mean, what a privilege to get that knowledge so early. Yeah, yeah. So many women are in the dark at that point. Well, I knew way too much at that point. And um, <laughs> I could... time to prepare. <laughs> I look back at my husband and that look on his face, I mean, that'll stick with me for the rest of my life. It was just, it was shock. And the first thing I said to him was, we ought to get a car. <laughs> you know, like not a new car, but a car. <laughs> we have to stop taking the bus. And, um, you know, it was frightening, frightening for 24 hours. Two babies, two babies that I have to carry and be pregnant with for nine months. How am I going to do it? But um, I, f I felt so lucky. And five years ago, I would have given anything to have had this problem of, um, of a twin pregnancy mm -hmm. and honestly a day went by and I I was thrilled and I remained thrilled through the whole pregnancy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there wasn't a day that went by that I was like this is terrible yeah. it was magnificent and I never never felt better um, never felt better until I met them and uh, and, and then that was better <laughs> but uh, that was awesome uh, but I, I've, I had a wonderful time being pregnant with them. And what I learned uh, while I was pregnant was that um, there is no singular perfect pregnancy. I thought that immediately as a twin pregnant uh, woman that I would be subjected to high risk everything. 
and that things might not go my way. But uh, I met a lot of women with a regular pregnancy, you can see it the old fashioned way. And, you know, they, they had autoimmune um, diseases they were dealing with or, or some issue or some bleeding. You know, things come up. It's, it's not perfect. It's, it's still magical and wondrous and you don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's a good thing. Um, but the whole thing felt very natural, aside from the fact that when you're carrying twins, people notice your pregnancy in a different way, especially towards the end. And, and so that, that issue of, you know, did she receive uh, IVF to conceive these children, that, that comes up when you mention that, it, that it's twins. And um, it, was, it was weird to wrap my head around that. And but the fact is, um, now, that, um, now that I did conceive my children this way, I have no trouble acknowledging that that's the way it came about. Who cares? And if someone had told me, I mean, someone probably did early on that, hey, if you go through this process and you're successful, um, you're not going to think about that for a nanosecond I, after. I for sure don't I'm, do that. I'm sure you, I'm <laughs> you won't sure care you how your little you kids You won't came. care. Exactly. That's, I mean, yeah, it, it won't matter. Um, you will be wrapped up in other stuff. And even, if, and even if it doesn't go well, even if you have a conclusion that is not what you were hoping for, um, at least you tried. I, I felt like even if I went through the unsuccessful round, at least I made an effort to do something. And I was, I was not ashamed uh, at that point. I, I was ashamed at the beginning because I, I didn't know. And I, I didn't know, you know, how wonderful uh, it could be. So, yeah. And I ended up with two healthy babies. And yeah. that's that, so great. That's the that's dream. So that's the yeah. Dream. yeah. I mean, you are such a model of, of gratitude. A, you, I mean, and, and you're, a, you're a very sensitive woman. I mean, not that mm -hmm. most people are not, but mm -hmm. you, um, you really needed to dig in and use the tools that you have, you know, and that mm -hmm. you knew would benefit you to, to keep you in, you know, that mindset that you had for so long, you know, and, yeah. and I, I admire you for that. And, uh, um, thank you puppy dog huh? you're so welcome yeah sorry uh, no, it's okay i and and i think that's that's important i'm i'm about to uh, an interview i'm going to do soon is with a woman that you know uh not that dissimilar a story you know went mm -hmm. through everything but ended up on the other side without, yeah without children you know and uh you know we don't hear those stories quite enough so yeah. i i really appreciate your your gratitude in it and that uh, um I think that that's how, that's one of the keys. You know, I'm I'm started to write another book, and Great. it's and it's more about the the spiritual principles because I I find the longer that I've practiced, the more important those pieces are. But you know, um, and and most of them are a practice. So if you don't mind, I would love to ask you just some quick little questions about. Of course. Uh, and and. Your your answers can be succinct or, or sure. however you know, sure. but these are are topics that I have noticed and found over the years that are are so unbelievably important, almost principles that need to yeah. be um, practiced and uh, to achieve you know where where you are now. Yeah. Um, so how did love? How important was love? Oh, love is everything. Yeah. You know. Um, I, I think, you know, immediately I, I think of my partner and, and his love, but also self-love, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it sounds kind of trite, but there's a lot of self-loathing that happens when your body's not working the way you want it to. And so uh, making changes in my life so I could get to a point where I felt a lot more lovable mm -hmm. made it a lot easier. And I, and I think it made the conditions in my womb um, a happy place for a baby to grow. And it, it f was able, you know, when my husband and I were to connect and reach a decision that we were going to move forward with this together, um, it felt like there was an environment where love would grow um, in the form of a baby. And I, and I, it, it's just so key. I mean, you, and yeah, you've got to love the stuff that you're doing, um, you know, outside yourself too. Switch and job really made a huge difference to me. Um, 
you know, cutting out people in my life that weren't, you know, serving me. Just, you know, I, I saw who I wanted wanted to. I, yeah, I made some modifications in my life to, to make it easier. Did contribution or giving back or did 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 you find yourself in that role somehow or pouring yourself into that in any way you know sadly no yeah, um that's, i that's totally fine. yeah i um have a hard time my kids are now a year and a half uh, making time for a lot of stuff but um <laughs> it, it's no big deal. I mean, again, I, I have no interest in becoming martyr mom or, uh, about any of that stuff because um, people have it a lot harder than I do. But um, the the small way that I give back is that I'm far more sensitive to the needs of people uh, going through perhaps private struggles. I mean, my uh, perceived th struggle as a twin mom is very public and um, <laughs> sort of on display when I walk down the street with two kids. I get a lot of um, sympathy. I get a lot of double, someone says double trouble to me weekly. Oh, uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, it's frankly, it's no trouble. And I am very quick to say, no, double joy. Like I'm, I'm living the life here. But it's people that, um, you know, privately are struggling with something um, far more, I think, attuned to um, to those things. And, um, you know, particularly women going through something, like wanting a pregnancy, uh, wanting a partner. You know, this, this is invisible. And I think, you know, we need to uh, be careful of what we say uh, to people going through stuff. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And you have contributed in a few ways uh, by my requests as well, as well as being here today. So that mm. is, and, and these spiritual principles are, they're not, you, you don't have to dive into them all. You need a couple and you need to practice. Yeah. But what yeah. about surrendering? Where did that step in? Oh, I, um, you absolutely need to surrender and, um, you know, you can take surrendering in a different way. You can throw up your hands and forget about the whole thing and just decide, well, this is not for me. Or you can say, hey, I maybe there's something bigger going on and, and I'm open to it. My body's open to it. My mind's open to it. Um, and, and now in, in my life, I, I surrender so much more quickly. Um, I used to ruminate about problems. I used to overthink and, you know, I... I remember um, you handing me a book that had nothing to do with fertility and, um, mm. you know, so that I could steer my mind away from something. And, and that's a form of surrender. Um, now, because my time is, um, my, my personal time is so limited that I, I have less time to ruminate about things. And so I'm very quick to surrender to, ah, this is not working. We got to change course. And um, I think the sooner that anyone can do that, if they're facing hardship, um, the faster they will, you know, reach resolution. Right. Um, so how, yeah. so tied into surrender, how did having trust and faith, did that ever, you know, seep in and give you comfort or was that something yeah. that you tried to yeah. cultivate? I, I'm not religious. My family is not religious. Mm -hmm. Um, but I remember having a very poignant moment with my father, um, you know, as I was in the midst of, of trying to conceive. We were out for dinner together, just the two of us. And he could see that I was in a great deal of pain. And he's a doctor himself. And I could tell that he wanted to solve this pain for me, and he couldn't. And he said, um, you know, Katie, I don't pray, but I wish and I hope and I dream um, that you will have children. I wish this for you. And it was it was the sweetest thing. And I'll remember it always because um, I think, you know, dreams are good things. It's, it's okay to have lofty um, hopes and, and dreams. I sort of shut down the possibility at, at several points along the way. And I think it, it does me no good. I, you know, one can come from a school of thought that's like, well, don't build yourself up. Uh, you know, and maybe largely something that I've carried around with me is lower your expectations and you won't be disappointed. Oh, this is not, it has not served me well. And um, I encourage anyone 
facing the same hardship to uh, raise your expectations about what's possible because you will inevitably lift yourself up in the process and get a little further on your journey. You might not get to exactly where you want to be, um, but you may get a lot further than, than you hoped. Yeah. So what you're kind of saying there is, is or, or how I interpret it is if you push yourself, you grow. Yeah, and, and and how important was self growth, you know, uh, and personal development to to help you achieve, you know, your goal. I I wish I'd done more, but it was certainly um, it was key, and I I took a a leap of faith, I guess you could say, in, in leaving my job. Um, you know, financially we were able to be okay with that happening. I went back to school. I got some education in another area that I was passionate about, but that I never sort of waded into. And um, I ended up meeting a group of people that had nothing to do with fertility or um, making babies that I became very close to, and I'm still close to um, this day, a group of people in, in one of the classes I took, and I see them on a regular basis now. So um, cultivating your life in other areas, I think, is is really big. If you expand your mind, uh, period, you're open to, to other things. And I think your body is able to withstand a lot more when you grow in that way. Yeah. So my next piece is, thank you for that. Uh, my next piece is gratitude. And I already gave you big props for, yeah. for yeah. that. But uh, do you really believe that um, being grateful, you know, played a role as well? Yeah, I do. And uh, I'm not that person, I think, um, naturally. Um, I, I, I'm I, not sort of a Pollyanna type. and um, But I sort of turned into one uh, yeah. privately because uh, I think there are, there are moments, um, little little threads that you can pick up along the way everywhere where there's room for, for gratitude and... Um, you know, it can be as something as um, mundane as the breakfast you make yourself mm -hmm. or um, a smile from a stranger or an acknowledgement of something well done, um, you know, a beautiful meal prepared for you. Mm -hmm. um, I love to cook. And so when, when someone gives me props in that area, it makes me feel good. Um, something that was well written, something that um, is beautiful to watch, um, art, anything, uh, you have to you have to find it because um, you know if if you're constantly complaining it then you're you're just going to perpetuate that and so I need to to perpetuate something different and um, once you sort of step on the gratitude train uh, you can you can get pretty far um, and it, it changed the way I walked down the street you know it changed the way my face looked. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I needed that in pregnancy. I, I needed not to become bogged down in my own, you know, changing physical body. Um, and as you say, you know, preparing the house with, you know, certain products that you need um, before pregnancy, you know, treat yourself as though you're pregnant before you are. Um, it made it very easy for me to transition into feeling happy while I was pregnant because I was already in that place before I became pregnant. Um, so... I think it, it made for healthy pregnancy along the way. So, so gratitude not only really helped you and your well-being, but do you believe that it helped on, on an esoteric level attract what yeah. you were hoping for? Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I felt like a, a magnet for good through my pregnancy. Um, awesome. Felt like it was the babies. I mean, people were just like, "Look at that belly! Look at that giant belly!" But you know, I. I got in touch with um, some a group of people doing yoga that really helped me, and um, it just felt like um, I was all shiny and, and new. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I, I when I look my most disheveled now as as a parent, um, I, I try and remember that, um, particularly before I go to bed, yeah. or when or when the day starts. You know. I, there's those gratitude journals out now that are, our, you know, five minutes before bed and five minutes yeah. in the morning. I recommend those to every everybody. So yeah. I believe in the power of gratitude. Now, you mentioned that you're, you're, you're not 
you're clearly a spiritual woman, but not a religious woman. But mm. did you pray? I yeah, I think um, I think the day before um, the embryos were, were transferred, I think I probably did pray. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a very quiet, personal prayer. Um, not because I felt entitled to anything, um, but you know, magically, um, once the embryos uh, had been placed inside me, I had some acupuncture with one of your colleagues and listened to some beautiful music on headphones and um, had a very odd spiritual moment where um, so a piece of Debussy music that I'd actually walked down the aisle to um, on my wedding day uh, was the first piece of music I heard when those headphones were placed on me um, as I lay there minutes after the embryo transfer, I thought, wow, this is just about as spiritual as it gets. Mm -hmm. This piece of music meant so much to me, um, you know, in, in my marriage and my love for my husband. And here it was potentially guiding me towards a, a pregnancy. And I thought, well, that's, that's a heck of a good sign. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Did you ever actually meditate? I, 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 I feel like prayer is, is communication with mm -hmm. With yeah. God, with the universe, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. meditation is listening after. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I certainly did. Yeah. Okay. I, cer I certainly did. And um, I, I meditated with Oprah. I meditated with myself uh, at the beach, yeah. um, you know, in yoga class. Uh, there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think anything that can calm the mind is, is a good thing because we're constantly just going over things in our head and it's not always the healthiest thing. You can't sort of think your way out of something. Right, right. You said yeah. that at the beginning yeah. so eloquently. What yeah. about what about living in now? I the Buddhists refer to it as mindfulness. You know, how yeah. did was that something that just kinda naturally was born from this? You had to, to Yeah. to be, yeah. Yeah. I'm but it's hard to put that into practice when you're trying to conceive. Right. Uh, I And nowhere is it more um, fundamentally true than when you have a child um, or children. Now all I do is live in the moment. I don't remember anything that happened three hours ago, frankly. And I don't know what's happening three hours from now. And that's cool. Yeah. That's fine. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a stay-at-home mom now, and um, I'm I'm focused on the now very much. So, and and I I'm pleased to live that way. I wish I I lived that way before, and I hope that in the future that's something that um, you know, I'm I'm concerned with because you can only really control the moments you have um, around you. Yeah, Eckhart Tolle would be proud. Yeah, he's the guru, so. the guru of living in now. Anyway, yeah. finally, and then I, I will, I will let you go. You, you have sure. generous, been so generous with your time, but um, I feel like in a recipe for achieving your dream, almost in anything, yeah. Uh, in particular here, uh, you know, getting to your family, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important ingredients may be perseverance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a marathon. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a sprint. I thought it was a sprint. I thought we can go this way, we can go this way, we can do things fast, quick, we'll get this taken care of. But no, it's a marathon. There are different hard patches. Um, but I guarantee to the women facing this um, and, and the men out there too that are supporting them, um, it, it starting the marathon is the hardest part. Right. Um, because for, for me, I, I was just so reluctant to take a step forward and taking any step forward is better than nothing at all and um, you know you may fear the depths of despair at an unhappy outcome but really I think the depths of despair occur before um, any step is taken and I think it's that's that's essentially perseverance isn't it to, to move into that marathon and not be afraid of the fight um, and and I think in any challenge, that, that's so fundamentally key um, to get started. Just get started. Educate yourself. Educate yourself about your own body and you know, become an advocate for your own body. If, if you're not getting the information you need, then time to turn to a different practitioner or a different group of, of support. I, I, 
I have a, a, a theory that I have seen play out so many times over the years now that um, the power, you know, someone would say, well, you need to have willpower. You know, you, yeah. need, to, you need to keep uh, going on or starting the marathon, which is a great yeah. perspective. But to me, I, I feel like where where uh, infertility struggles or, or difficulty conceiving or getting pregnant uh, are a marathon that is very motivational and perseverance is is an inevitability most often because the why versus the will the why is so powerful yeah there's why yeah. power uh, and i think it trumps willpower in this case yeah 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 i i i think if you dig down deep and it, if you really want a family um, then yeah, that, that'll carry you through. Right. You know, I, I had people say, you know, isn't it kind of selfish to, to want this? Isn't it selfish to, to want a child? <laughs> like, I mean, what isn't selfish in life? It's so uh, full, I would say. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, this, I, I knew that I was going to be able to do this. I knew I'd be good at it. I knew I was deserving. I finally knew I was deserving of having a family, even if it wasn't sort of coming to me in the, the traditional way. Once I got over that, um, then I was able to move forward and, um, yeah, set your intentions and, um, you know, acknowledge the why and then, and then move forward. Right. Any final pieces of advice for the women watching? No, I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm right. I'm right. Th I'm right there with you. Mm. I'm right there with you. And I, I acknowledge what a privileged position it is for me to be sitting here talking to you on the other side of it. I never thought I would be here. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, I feel extremely fortunate. You can hear it in my voice. Mm -hmm. um, but um, hey, keep at it. I was. I was. I, I listened to other people talk about their success stories. It was. It's painful to hear. But it, I, I hope it's inspirational too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the Conception Channel podcast. Um, I'm sure so many of your wise words and and your courage to be here and and your story will help so many women because uh, I will do my best to make sure as many women that need to hear this will hear it. My pleasure, Spence. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having me. Thank you. Talk. See you again soon, hopefully. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.